All right, it seems like we're leveling off with the number of people joining. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining on this very cold Wednesday. I hope you all are staying warm. Um, so today is our third session in conversations on DEI in scientific events. Um, and this event is put on by um, my lab group and myself um, in Brow. And um, to give you an update in case you haven't joined before, but I think everyone has at this point, um, the reason why we started this is because there's been a lot of, you know, talk about increasing diversity, equity, inclusion in the scientific realm. Um, and we felt like there was a lot of talk, but not a lot of action when it comes to actually implementing uh, DEI practices, specifically in the context of scientific um, workshops and meetings. So we came up with this, this idea to really start just having a discussion about what does this look like? How can we increase the DEI within the, that framework. Um, and so our talk is loosely based and inspired on the Inclusive Scientific Meetings Guide um, from 500 Women Scientists, which I highly recommend you take a look at. Um, but this is just the cover here. And, and we discuss this a lot in the second session. Wow, that's a tongue twister. Second session um, with Angie Pendergrass. So that recording is available. Um, and just some ground rules before we even get started today, because we are talking about some uh, potentially sensitive topics, please mute yourselves during the presentation. Um, be kind, be respectful of other people's views and opinions, um, and also listen to other people's perspectives. And our format for today, uh, we're really lucky to have some great speakers um, from NCAR's Education Outreach Office. So we're joined by Rebecca Hacker and Marissa Barra. Um, who are going to discuss conducting inclusive scientific events, opportunities, and strategies for virtual meetings. So we'll have a presentation from them, followed by some breakout discussion rooms. Um, and then any remaining time, we will discuss some questions submitted via Slido. Um, so if you have a question at any time, please use the link in the chat to submit an anonymous question via Slido, and then we can address it um, at the end with everyone. And yeah, without further ado, um, I'll hand it off to our speakers, Marissa and Rebecca. So thank you for joining today. Okay. Okay, everyone, see them. I'm actually unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. Okay, great. So yeah, first of all, um, Thank you, Erin, for inviting Marissa and I to be part of this workshop series and to um, kind of be able to present a couple of thoughts on, on the topic of virtual meetings today. And um, what we'll do is we'll do quick introductions and kind of setting um, the kind of goals for our uh, talk today. And they're not, we don't have a super long talk, as you just said, Aaron, and we hopefully then have enough time to go into breakouts and um, have some discussion because I feel that all of us have gone collectively through this experience of having to do um, and attend and organize virtual meetings over the past two years. So I'm fairly sure there will be a lot of collective wisdom um, between all of us. So and in terms of introductions, as Aaron said, my name is Rebecca Haka. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm also comfortable with they, there. Um, I am the director for education and outreach and the ASP program here at NCAR. I've been at NCAR for over 15 years in different education roles. And I love it here, obviously. Last year, I spent some time at the NSF and I'm just coming back. So everything feels new. And um, I'm by training, I'm a geographer and cultural anthropologist. And so now I'll ask Marissa to introduce herself. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm Marisa Vada. Uh, I use pronouns she, her. And I would like to acknowledge the land that we that I live and work on is on the traditional territory of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and UT. Um, I am fairly new to NCAR UCAR. Um, I started in June um, working with the SOARS program as their STEM undergraduate coordinator and currently working with NCAR UNO you know, as their DEI and education specialist. So I do both positions. Um, and my background is in geosciences, but 
the past few few years, um, maybe two or three years, I've gotten really involved in DEI and education and broadening the broadening participations for um, historically marginalized communities. So that's kind of my passion and what I'm really into right now. And so thank you for inviting me to come and join and be a part of this discussion with y'all. Thank you, Marissa. And so before I jump into our slide deck, um, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm at least speaking for myself, I am no expert in virtual meetings by, by any means. Um, and what we're presenting here today is um, part of Marissa and I basically conducted a, a literature review looking at very recent uh, papers over the last um, two years that have looked at the impact kind of opportunities, but also impacts of virtual meetings on the scientific community with a lens of inclusion. So we'll present some of these findings today. And we added um, her and my kind of experiences. As I said, we all have been through a lot <laughs> of virtual meetings over the past um, two years. And then we asked some colleagues uh, for input. And so they are acknowledged here on the title slide as well. Lorena Medina Luna, Valerie Sloan, and Dan Zitlow from our education office, who all um, organized, led, and shared, and attended a lot of virtual meetings and had some great input. So that's what we're presenting here, but by no means it's like a comprehensive volume of, of how to do virtual meetings. It's a discussion point. It's kind of starting us off with a discussion, and hopefully we can come together to a couple of things. Um, so I wanted to kind of just kick us off by kind of an obvious statement, maybe, but just grounding us in acknowledging that scientific conferences and meetings still play a really, really important role in our community, even with everything that happened over the past two years. Um, conferences are important in the exchange of ideas and the exchange of knowledge in our community. And from my lens, personally, I believe that it's very important for early career researchers and professionals because it's a great way to make themselves known to the community and meeting um, people, meeting their future colleagues. And I just love this photo because it reminds us how it felt when we were together in person and not staring at a screen like we do today. And this is a photo of, I believe, a CSM tutorial a couple of years ago at the NCA Mesa Lab. And I also wanted to acknowledge that conducting and leading inclusive meetings is really a part of our overall commitment to DEI and in the institution and across the community. And that's why I kind of circled the creative inclusive environments here in the middle, because I think that's what meetings are and that's what meetings should be, an inclusive environment for all to share their knowledge and to learn and to, and, and to meet new colleagues. And, and I think it's really centered to everything. Um, of course, we have a lot of strategic plans that speak to this commitment. Um, of course, it's a joint effort between all of us and there is an investment, but it really all centers around this inclusion um, goal. And I, at this point, I really wanted to thank Aaron and the organizing team for taking this on and for um, organizing uh, this workshop series. I think it's really important. Um, we are providing staff training with this, a training for, for everybody on this topic. And that's, I thought it was a great idea when you proposed it. And that's why at least partial funding comes from our office for that. So again, just really thank you for it organizing all of that, Erin, and your great team. Now I'm handing it over to Marissa. Um, so why is it our responsibility to conduct inclusive meetings? Um, so when the new administration came in, they made it a point to have racial equality, equality um, racial equity, sorry, throughout the system, including in education. So they not only made this one of their priorities, but they also issued several executive orders around racial equity in education, especially with MSIs. So because this is a priority for the federal government funding agencies, 
like NSF are implementing these initiatives all in all activities and programs to broaden participation. But besides it being a federal government priority, the most important reason why you should have inclusive meeting is like the obvious moral reasons. It's just the right thing to do. Um, everyone should have an opportunity to be heard, seen and valued like we expressed in our article that was recently published in EOS. Um, as a bonus, we will all know, we all know that improving um, or including having more inclusive meetings improves the quality of the meetings, the outcomes, and of course, improves science. Next slide, please, Rebecca. Um, so there has been a few examples or a, quite a bit of examples in the past few years of conferences, big conferences like AMS, um, having more, broadening more of their invited speakers and people they invited to come and give presentations to the communities there. Um, so here's some examples of those, trying to make the inclusive meetings be more of a broadening more science and hearing more perspectives. Um, so one of the meetings they had, the Father Environmental Justice, who openly talks about environmental justice and environmental racism, Dr. Robert Bullard, who spoke both at AMS and, and AGU, which are two big conferences this last season. Um, Paulette Blanchard was invited to speak on indigenous-led environmental movements and activisms, and activism and pushes institutions to hire from higher indigenous people and other historically marginalized communities. And then Joseph Trulio Falcon speaks on the language barriers in science and is working to bridge that for the Latinx community. Thank you, Marissa. And now, and now thinking a little bit about what virtual meetings have brought to, to this um, effort of broadening participation at conferences, making conferences more accessible, and more inclusive and making them welcoming and safe environments for all. Roughly exactly two years ago, we all found ourselves moving from in-person events to working from home. And so as you see here on the slide, moving away from traveling often by plane to conferences, being stuck at airports, having really good meetings over coffee or at a poster board, we're finding ourselves um, at home staring at a screen. And we've lost a lot. And there's, um, I don't wanna undermine or undersell the impact it had. And I think many of us, speaking for myself, miss in-person meetings. But recent research has found that there are some surprising benefits of moving to virtual meetings. And because I believe that virtual meetings, it's at least in some part will stay in our reality. They might become hybrid meetings or maybe we will toggle between in-person and virtual meetings. I think it's um, a valuable thing to look at um, in terms of what it has done. And it's surprising how much we can quantify actually the benefits of virtual meetings. So here are some results of recent papers um, and several, and we're providing all of the um, the papers and literature references at the end of this talk, and um, we we'll can share the slides with all of you. But what we're finding is that virtual meetings have reduced several things, and they all make sense, right? If you think about it, the time away from home is reduced, decreased. So if you have community or family responsibilities, that might help, but also things like visas. If you have to travel abroad for a conference, people coming here, all of that burden between visas and travel funding um, has been eliminated. Some accessibility issues um, have been um, eased, not all of them certainly, but some. And of course, as an institution like NCAR, looking at the carbon footprint decrease of travel, to me personally, that's very um, important. And so here's just some data of recent papers. Um, the EGU found that their meeting from in-person in 2019 to virtual in 2020 jumped by close to 10,000 people, um, jumped up um, by close to 10,000 people by going online, which um, speaks a lot 
about accessibility of conferences. And if you look at um, the uh, graphic that I included here, um, you see from another paper, they compared where people were coming from for conferences. And this is for one sample um, called Recom Conference. Uh, the map, the world map above is the in-person, the last in-person meeting. And then the following year when they moved uh, to a virtual environment, you see that the global south had suddenly was able to send participants to this meeting. And to Marissa's earlier point, just imagine what that did to the conversation, the discourse at the meeting, the perspectives that were suddenly present at that meeting. And I think that's a real huge impact. And I believe we've seen this as well for some of our workshops and tutorials at NCAR. Um, here on, on, on my right, you see from Skiles 2021, uh, they were looking, comparing attendance from what they call IPC as in-person conferences to then VC virtual conferences the following year and how attendance jumped. Um, they averaged this out over a couple of um, science and engineering meetings. And the color bars don't, they're not quite in the, in the right um, dimension, I think, um, in terms of, percentage of increase, but you can see how it um, really uh, benefited women and genderqueer attendees um, who attended in much larger numbers. Um, it also impacts who we're inviting. So back to Marissa's point of all of us trying to broaden who we invite and who we can bring to meetings, virtual meetings open an opportunity um, to think who we want to invite. Uh, people who may not want to travel to our conferences can suddenly be uh, called in for, for one talk. And so a very recent example is the, if you had a chance to listen to the really outstanding lecture by Dr. Shepard last week, um, we were able to host him um, because it was virtual. Because if you know Dr. Shepard, you know that he doesn't travel by plane. And I doubt he would have driven out for two days just to give the lecture. So virtual meetings open opportunities. And another author, and that's the last uh, portion of the slide, um, also has found that being online has given, especially early careers, more an opportunity to ask questions, for example, in chat rooms or interfaces like Slido, and that across the board, um, questions and queries have become of higher quality than in in-person meetings. And I thought that was really interesting. So I'll hand it back over to Marissa. Um, so as Rebecca um, alluded to earlier, we had a lot of good impacts, but there were challenges and losses for conducting meetings online. Um, some of these challenges uh, and losses have to do with like limiting peer interactions and opportunities for collaboration and networking with each other, especially during those like poster halls and social events at conference meetings where we all, I know I've networked pretty well in those situations and I know that maybe some of you all have too. Um, screen fatigue is really a big thing that is a problem, especially whenever you're having back-to-back -back meetings and you don't really have that time to really enjoy that break time and like, not stare at a computer screen for eight hours a day or more. Um, internet access isn't great for anybody, for a lot of people. I know personally I don't have great internet access, but I know even in other remote areas, especially places that are more, more for historically marginalized communities, they don't have access to high-speed internet. And so that can be a barrier. Um, we still don't have a lot of closed captioning at meetings. Um, we don't have a lot of other accessibilities that are seem to be at this point after being in this situation for two years might have been more readily available than what it is right now with all the technology we have available to us. Um, and then of course, if you're in, in hybrid meetings, that's a totally different, unique challenges and things related there. Um, there's not a lot of, you have to make sure that everyone is included both online and offline and that there's um, good coordination and technical staff available to make sure that when you do have technical difficulties, if you do have technical difficulties, you have somebody there for support. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so this is from an article from Levetis et al. Um, suggesting ways or uh, suggesting some steps to have more inclusive online conferences. Um, so the first, there's three big steps. The first step is unlocking access or removing barriers that prevent access to online conferences. So this is something simple, not simple, but some things that are been known barriers are like time zones, making sure that time zones, there's an appropriate time zone for all participants, um, allowing flexible personal schedules, incorporating breaks to allow each other to catch up to the discussion, um, be aware of geographical restrictions. There's some places that um, don't allow certain platforms to be included there. So be aware of what, where your audience is, what participants you have, and how they might be able to access your meeting. Um, having those disability accommodations is really important. Um, and then being upfront about that cost, because as much as a virtual meeting should be less because you're not traveling somewhere, um, there's still some meetings still have a pretty big cost that that could be an additional barrier to some people. So removing some of these barriers can really help unlock that access to people. And then the second point was designing a meaningful participation or building an environment that will enable this participation for a diverse audience. So using, um, designing user-friendly navigation and having support and people to help guide people that might just not understand how the platform works and having them available, knowing where those people are available, having good communication with your audience is really important. Um, make sure that you avoid things like Zoom bombing, um, where you have people who aren't really supposed to be in part of the meeting and are. So registration, there's now registration forms that are available for people to register and they get the direct link. Um, and th that happens for both free and un and one uh, meetings that do cost. Um, there's also ways as the facilitator, you can have a waiting room and you can put people in the waiting room. These are things that I think most of us already know, but just an, another thing to be able to use those tools. Um, and then of course, consider privacy for participants. I know a lot of people wanna record meetings so people can watch it later, but be sure that you are asking people if they wanna be recorded, or at least they know that the meeting will be recorded because some people might have some internal reasonings or beliefs where they don't think that they should be recorded. Um, and then the last point that this, uh, these authors made were embracing co-creation and open leadership to focus on building diverse leadership. So really going out to the communities and um, opening up for volunteers to help put this con put conferences together, putting their voices in the conference, intentionally seeking and engaging these groups of, of historic historically marginalized people or communities and begin um, having them incorporated into the meeting and then developing pathways that can really um, help the, the, the participants attend the conferences and then join those leadership roles that to help participants not only attend a conference, um, join those leadership roles that can really provide transparency on how leadership can, can become whenever you do these conferences where it's not as scary as what people might assume that it would be. And I think this is both of us, Rebecca. Yeah, so um, of course, as I said, there are so many um, tips and things that you can look up for best practices around virtual meetings. And some of the papers that we'll share with you uh, list some of them here we are just pointing at a couple of them and maybe also as a jumping point into our discussion groups. And I think really one of the key pieces Marissa and I both wanted um, to leave you with is that virtual meetings expand the possibilities of who we invite as speakers and organizers and to invite you to really think broadly about it um, and share the power and the leadership of who is organizing a meeting. And um, both when we're organizing meetings at NCAR, but also when we are asked to maybe share a meeting at a scientific conference, you can always invite um, a co-chair and then think broadly who that is. And I believe that virtual meetings have um, made that just a tiny bit easier um, 
for for us. And maybe I'll take the second point and then Marissa, I'll ask you to jump in a bit, but um, plan ahead. And I think we can talk about this a bit in the breakouts that virtual meetings aren't necessarily easier to run uh, just because we're not all in the same room. I believe we actually need additional staffing to do this and to do it well, which means resources and um, yeah, funding and just extra staffing because technical questions are different. We need to make sure that access is given. And we also need to make sure that sessions are moderated um, properly. And some of the best practices that we see in in-person meetings absolutely translate over to the virtual setting where you should always have more than one moderator for a session, especially now that, and I believe we're doing this here, um, one person is watching the chat and maybe another person is dealing with access and one maybe supporting the speakers. I don't know, do you wanna jump in a little bit, Marissa, in the next ones? Yeah, I would say um, one of the other things is to really highlight some of your participants or let them have a chance to really talk about or participate in there. So having interactive um, activities like using the Gather Town application or doing polls or ward clouds or things or even the Slido that you have in the group chat. These are all ways that participants can um, interact with everybody, but still be engaged in a conversation and what else is going on. Of course, I think that is important to let your participants know that these activities will be happening so they're aware and prepared to be engaged and be knowing that it's going to be an interactive engagement um, workshop or meeting of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, I think okay. that covers all of them. Maybe. Well, yeah, and I, I, I wanted to um, maybe just speak, I, I think we had covered earlier, I think Marissa earlier had spoken about accessibility and live captions, I think, and I want to own that up for NCAR, UCAR, we, we still don't have that in place all the time and we need to do better. And I think just being very aware of what it means uh, to, to conduct a meeting um, really to be supportive of all accessibility needs is, is challenging, but I think we, we can do better in that area. And one thing that um, I wanted to point out is this, like the camera use, there's now some research out that um, being constantly in front of a camera is quite stressful. And it's different. It's not like in an in-person interaction. And for some people, it's truly not possible. I have a colleague who just the other and a friend who just recently had an accident skiing. So she has to lay down a lot to rest her back, right? And so she's obviously not going to turn her camera on. But even though she's mentioned it a couple of times, people still ask her, why don't you turn your camera on? And so imagine you're someone with a um, constant physical a different ability and is uncomfortable being on camera all the time where maybe they have differences in internet speed as Marissa mentioned or even just the work environment is not conductive to be on camera so I would say let's give each other a break there and um, maybe as a last point before we jump into discussion Aaron is that um, invite and an invitation to assess how your DEI goals were met in this virtual environment. You might already have surveys and um, things that you've been using for your in-person workshops and meetings, and now think how you can maybe add some questions or adapt your surveys and assessments to track how the uh, virtual environment worked for your participants. And here's the list of resources that I've mentioned a couple of times now. Um, we will share them with all of you. I thought there was quite some interesting literature out now on virtual meetings. And if that helps you as you organize your meetings or you have to justify additional cost uh, to your uh, leaders and supervisors, I think there's some good resources there um, that you could um, cite and refer to. And so Aaron, you had asked us for a couple of questions that we might wanna take into breakout. And these are just proposals. Um, certainly we can talk 
about all kind of inclusive meetings or contributions that, that you all have about things that you found. But here are some questions that we're proposing. So the first one would be just in general, what opportunities do you see in making meetings more inclusive? And that can be in person, can be virtual, but also what I suspect we'll see a lot now in, in hybrid meetings. And then what, what Marissa pointed to, this loss of, of personal interactions at meetings. How can we improve the way that we facilitate these deeper connections between people but at virtual conferences. How do we do that? So we don't lose uh, the mentoring aspects for early careers and just the meeting new colleagues and making networking, having these connections now that we interact in this way. And maybe you have found some really good ways of doing that. And so an invitation overall, just what challenges, tips and strategies could you share uh, with all of us? So I will stop sharing, Aaron, if that's okay, um, and follow your guidance and what we do next. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rebecca and Marissa. That was a really great presentation. Um, I think these are also really great discussion questions. So I put those discussion questions in the chat, and um, Jenny is going to break us into breakout rooms, which we will do for 15 minutes. So we'll meet back here at 2.50 PM. Um, and we'll start with one of the questions. Uh, you can start with the first question with um, any of them, but we'll try to at least cover one of those questions and then we'll regroup. And then if you know more questions come up, which I see they have in Slido, um, we will address those at um, the last 10 minutes. So thank you again for the great presentation. And I'll see some of you in the breakout rooms. All right, thanks for joining back in the main room, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good discussion. So um, with our last 10 minutes, we are going to address some of the questions on Slido. Um, I don't know, Ifan, would you like to share your screen if you have Slido up? And we can just go through the questions um, in the order that they're encountered. And um, I will say these questions are probably directed towards the speakers, but I think it's from anyone really nice given that these are such open-ended questions. So really any input um, is welcome here. Awesome. Thank you, Ifan. Cool, so I'll just, um, sorry, what was that? I said you're welcome. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sweet. Um, so yeah, I'll just start reading the questions. Um, so Astrid asked, I experienced that a big challenge in virtual meetings are poster sessions. Is there any advice how to improve interaction? Virtual rooms alone seem not to work. So um, Rebecca, Marisa, do you have any input on this or anyone else feel free to jump in? Um, um, I think I'll start. defer. Yeah, I'll defer to Marissa on this one. She's organized a lot more than, than I have. Um, well, so we organized for the SOARS program. We got a whole bunch of different internships together and organized this huge poster symposium for the, well, I guess it wasn't, it was regional Boulder um, programs together. So we organized this this poster symposium for that um, using, it wasn't Gather Town. It was one of the other ones that are similar to the way the Gather Town is. Um, and so that was a way for people to walk around the poster session. And of course the camera's there. So you don't become visible unless you come closer to them and then the camera pops up. So it's more of a like walking around a poster session in, in person and running into somebody and being like, oh, tell me about your poster kind of situation, um, which is what we were trying to implement. And it went pretty well for most of our um, internship folks um, are our, our protégés, but they wanted to not stay by their poster and wander around everywhere else, um, which is fair. But I think 
one of those new things to do is maybe having different times allotted so that they can do those things. Um, and although I think we're going to be in person this year, so it's going probably back to smaller poster sessions. But using apps like that has been helpful for those types of poster sessions. I don't know how that could work in a conference session, though, because I did AGU poster conference session in person, but there was a virtual component and it was a mess from what I understand that a lot of the virtual um, people participate, participate, participants weren't really being able to access a lot of the posters or there was slow Wi-Fi or things like that. And so it was really a challenge, um, a lot of technical difficulties and things like that. So I, that's my two cents. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Marissa. Um, I don't know if, Astrid, do you want to elaborate on your question anymore since you um, did ask the question originally? Uh, no, it was more getting input if there is uh, some solution out there. Um, um, yeah, I, I know about these virtual rooms. Um, it seems that there's less... Um, uh, imprompt communication going on in the virtual poster uh, setting. I mean, people um, plan to go to a poster and, and um, talk to the person, but if you're less known or a student just new to the area, will have uh, more difficulty to uh, get somebody to uh, look at the poster. I mean, that's kind of uh, my experience from, um, from virtual settings. So. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Astrid. I think I've noticed that being a big issue too. So Gather Town seems great, but yeah, like Marissa said, I'm not sure how you employ that on a large scale like AMS or AGU, um, <laughs> given some of the technical difficulties. So hopefully we'll find a way to figure that out. Um, Great. Is there, oh yeah, Elizabeth. Hi, I just wanted to ask Astrid if the posters were maybe images were put online in advance. I can, they were, yeah, okay. Cause I gave the example, or I was gonna just share that with the CESM workshop last year, we had the poster presenters submit an image and we had them on the website from the beginning of the meeting so that we could um, encourage the participants to look at the image. And then we had Zoom rooms where each poster presenter, and um, I really did put a plea out to a lot of our staff, please, because I wanted the session to be successful. And I didn't want any of the poster presenters to, to sit in an empty Zoom room. So um, yeah, uh, but that's, that was all the my two cents that I had to, to offer, that it was in our limited capacity, we, we felt that it was, successful with with what we had to work with during during that and it was just for an hour and a half time slot yeah that's a really nice idea thanks for sharing that elizabeth all right um, if there are no other comments on that question um, we can go to the second one also asked by astrid do you have some sample questions to probe the accessibility of a meeting in a survey Um, I don't have them at hand, Astrid, but I'm fairly sure we can get you um, some and share those. I would probably also want to connect on this one with Cam's team. If they have developed a set for us, for, for NCAR and UCAR, but yeah, we'll, we'll try to get back to you on some, on some questions there. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, moving on to the next one, um, Anonymous asked, uh, how can we manage visibility inequities when some have cameras on and off for conferences and local meetings require no cameras, other options? Um, so again, I'll start with Mar Marissa and Rebecca. Do you have any suggestions on this? And then open the floor up to, to everyone else. Um. I'm going to give it to Rebecca first, and then I'll add on. So I'm seeing two questions back to back around cameras. And um, 
I think in many ways we can't require one or the other because everybody's comfort level is different, right? And it might also change um, from hour to hour. So uh, even if somebody tells you at the beginning, if you did some survey and you said, yes, I'm comfortable having my camera on, that might change. And the only thing that I could imagine is that you schedule in um, maybe intentional camera breaks where everybody has their camera off and it, everybody can relax a little bit. Um, that, that could be one idea. Um, but otherwise I would say you, I don't have um, uh, a strong opinion on, on how to, on how to manage that or how these inequities come in. I agree. I have given talks or lectured into a Zoom room where no one had their camera on and it felt really awkward. It wasn't easy. Um, and I know a lot of faculty deal with this right now where everybody has Zoom fatigue and people just turn their cameras off. And again, they might have home situations that they don't wanna share the camera. And it's hard on the faculty because they don't get that feedback, right? If anyone is learning anything. Um, so I think it's something that that will develop and that we still have to figure out how to do well. I don't have a perfect answer for that. And um, I don't know, Marissa, if you wanna jump in. I truly don't have a good answer. I think I have a good answer either, other than I like to just respect what people's uh, like wants are in that, that moment. Like we had in the breakout session, we had an individual who didn't want to, who didn't have their camera on and it wasn't a big deal. To me, they still participated in the present in the in the breakout room, and it was still it was still like a good discussion, in my opinion. So I don't I don't see how having a camera on it or off is really going to affect what you want across the meeting. Um, personally, I've had conversations because I don't have great internet issues, where everybody turns off their camera so they can hear me talk, and that seems okay to me too. So I I guess. I I don't know. I don't have any a strong opinion. I don't have a, a strong answer other than I'm okay with doing whatever anybody else is okay with doing kind of situation. So I don't want to force anybody to have a camera on or off. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Rebecca and Marissa. Um, I see Andy Newman left a comment in the chat. Andy, I don't know if you want to to that person or I can sure. repeat the comment. Yeah, go for it. I was the one that asked that question. I just forgot to add my name. <laughs> um, the first one it's yeah, just instinctively it's, it just seems so challenging to me because when I see somebody, then I just have that instinct, like that reaction of like, Oh, I know that person now a little bit more. And I just, I don't know how we, I don't know how we deal with it. So it's, it's great. To, <laughs> it's great. Or, or uh, I don't know if great is the right word, but it, it's interesting to hear that we don't, that everybody's kind of struggling with the same uh, issues, I guess. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Does anyone else have any input on the cameras on or off? It sounds like we're all stuck in the same boat of, it, it's just a tricky subject to navigate. Um, but yeah, feel free to have it, um, you know, make a comment if you do have any input. Um, okay, moving on to the last question, and then we'll wrap things up. Sorry, we're going a little bit over. Um, what do you think the best way to handle time zone differences uh, would be globally? Um, the optimal time for virtual meeting um, for us is not best for Asia. So any input on that? Um, I can go first on this, this one. I, so before my position here, I did work for NSF. Um, it's kind of, it's where I met Rebecca. Um, but I did a lot of work with the international community there. And it was really difficult to have, because I wasn't able to really travel because I was a federal employee to the international communities at that time. Um, it was really hard for me to work with them. So I had to adjust my time schedule for their convenience because I wanted something from them. So that meant like waking up at two in the morning or 
waking up at 7 a.m. and then having a late dinner or staying on at 8 p.m. and for them to wake up early. So it was always those really hard compromises. But I think for the most people that I worked with in that situation, we understood that it was going to be difficult. And so we had that understanding and just try to be as compromising of each other as much as possible. Um, Outside, more locally, I personally, because um, mountain time is kind of like in the middle of all the other time zones in the U.S., I try to keep it try to keep if I'm going to schedule meetings with anybody in the eastern or pacific coast to keep it between 11 ish to 2 p.m so maybe more like 10 a.m to 2 p.m um just to try to keep their schedules in mind too um but yeah no it's very difficult and you just have to constantly be thinking I know way too many time zones in my head and it's not fun and it's never going to be an easy solution, especially when you're working with international across, like in Asia, when there's 12 hour time differences there. So that's my two cents. Just try to be as compromising as possible. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Marissa. Um, does anyone else have input on this one? I know, I know it's a it's a tough one. Uh, again, another tricky question about virtual. Um, I will say. One thing I have seen successfully is a workshop that was, they had three tif- different time slots for presentations, given that it was mostly European, American, and um, Asian uh, participants, where they had you select which time zone you would prefer to present in as like a block. And I thought that was a nice way of you know, knowing that, you know, the Americans would be asleep when their Asian counterparts would be awake and vice versa. Um, so there was some overlap, but I thought that was a nice, happy medium. Yeah, does anyone else have input? Um, I see we're also four minutes past the hour. So people probably have their own Zoom fatigue at this point <laughs> from this meeting. So I don't want to contribute to that. Um, anyway, if you have any more questions, um, Rebecca, Marissa, would it be okay if people reached out to you with those questions? See some nodding. Okay. Sure. Of course. Yeah. It'd be lovely to keep that conversation. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, for joining today, everyone. Thanks to Marissa and Rebecca for presenting and for some really nice conversations. So, Um, I'll let everyone go and have a nice evening.